Welcome back, everybody. So today I have a really good tale for you about a South Boston boxer and local legend tough guy who ran afoul with some very dangerous people, i.e. the McLaughlins from Charlestown and the New York Commission. So I'm talking about Tommy Sullivan, and the setting for this story takes place on the South Boston waterfront. Now, the Boston waterfront during the 1950s was a hustling and bustling place full of blue-collar, rough-and-tumble guys like longshoremen, lumpers, stevedores. So, Boston in the 1950s, of course, was a much different city than you can imagine today. Today, the glitz and glamour and all the shiny buildings, it was a much dingier, grimier, gritty city. Now, Boston overall, and specifically South Boston Waterfront and Charlestown Waterfront, were some of the busiest commercial and industrial ports on the East Coast, and they were controlled by the ILA, which was the International Longshoremen's Association. So this was one of the biggest labor unions in the country at the time, and it was very important. It was almost second to the Teamsters. Longshoremen and the Teamsters are so important, especially like in the 1950s and 60s when they were at those labor unions were at the height of their power because they were controlling the flow of freight throughout the entire United States. Now I'm talking about any type of goods you're buying in a store, whether it's food from the grocery store, um, home goods from a department store, clothes from a clothing store, any type of stuff they're using in day-to-day life in the United States is being shipped over land by trucked by the Teamsters because all the trailer truck drivers over land are card-carrying Teamsters. That's why Jimmy Hoffa was such an important and powerful man because in the 1950s or 60s, if he wanted to, he could stop all the trucks in the United States and any type of goods that were supposed to be being delivered to a store would be stopped. Hoffa could keep products from touching the shelves and could put the American society basically in a tailspin. That's why politicians and important and powerful people like Bobby Kennedy and JFK hated Hoffa because he knew how powerful he was and he basically gave the middle finger to the establishment. Um, and also, so in turn, the Longshoremen's Association, the ILA, they controlled all the freight coming in by sea. So all these con- big container ships that would bring anything over from Europe, from Asia, basically any other continent that wasn't coming from the interior of the United States was coming in off these ships. The longshoremen would work with stevedores and lumpers as well. The stevedores would actually get into the freighters and down into the hole and unload the freight right off the ship for the longshoremen to haul out. And the lumpers would come in. Um, the lumpers, like at the place I used to work in Gloucester, I used to work in the waterfront in Gloucester, a cold storage facility. And the lumpers would come in, like we'd have a container that would come from like the South Boston, the Connolly Terminal there. And these big freighter containers come in and they have, uh, usually from China, and they got like cases of frozen fish, like just stacked, they're not palletized. So we'd get the um, container back into the door, then the lumpers would show up. And uh, we were all Teamsters at Americold, and you got a Teamster running the the forklift, and then the lumpers would come in, and they would say, like, if it's 40 or 50 cases to a pallet, and they'd build the pallet then. So I assume that the lumpers were building or depalletizing or palletizing um, stuff back then as well. So the longshoremen, like I said, they were very powerful um, union. They got a lot of card-carrying members. So there's a lot of guys down there that are, you know, ex-cons, uh, ex-boxers, fighters, um, criminals. So obviously where these busy ports are in neighborhoods like South Boston and Charlestown, they start to attract the attention of local thugs. So in Charlestown, of course, the local guys in the 1950s are the McLaughlins and the Hughes and that whole crew. And they're shaking down the waterfront heavy. Punchy McLaughlin, uh, Bernie, even Georgie are all, I think Connie Hughes and Steve Hughes as well, they were all card-carrying ILA members. They were longshoremen. But they weren't actually down on the docks working, hauling freight, um, breaking a sweat. I mean, if they were breaking anything, it was somebody's arm or their hands or a kneecap because they didn't pay up. So, I mean, they're down there um, pilfering the waterfront, taking whatever they want. They're down there plying their usual trades, loan sharking, bookmaking, 
they're extorting the local unions for money. They basically got a card for the as a labor union. I doubt they're paid one due in their life. Uh, if anything, they're exerting tribute from these labor unions. They're down there running amok. Anybody that's crossing them or looking at them wrong or saying a word, they're they're gonna get ganged up on. They're gonna get physically assaulted or worse. Um, it's just not a very like nice working environment. You know, you're doing this grueling, rough work down there, and then you got these roughneck guys down there basically shaking you down. Uh, you got to pay dues, and the union isn't really looking out for you. Uh, that's what was happening. So more and more and more, the labor unions are getting deeper and deeper and deeper involved with organized crime figures. And Starting like in the 1930s in New York City, like organized crime really started to take over the labor unions. And these guys who were running the unions, quote unquote, like the labor presidents that were voted in by like all the labor members and stuff, they are totally in the pocket of organized crime. And organized crime is taking money from them. They're using them as a, like a bank to fund their illegal enterprises. And it's just like, and there's nothing people can do. They really, if they speak out, violence is going to be on them. So by the 1940s, the federal government is starting to put like a lot of heat on New York City and the waterfront. And they're totally aware of how organized crime is very involved. So by the 1950s, early 1950s, it's rumored that New York City starts to branch out and starts to look up towards Boston, see kind of Boston as, uh, kind of wide open and they start working with punch like the mclaughlin start to develop a relationship with new york city in the late 1940s and so because of the amount of money involved due to like the dues and the bank that these unions have and not only that because access to the docks and the freight coming off uh, these guys get first dibs to anything they want. I mean, there's all types of booze, probably tobacco, specialty foods, all types of stuff that can be resold for a profit or just kept for your own consumption that you don't have to pay for. So, I mean, this is like a huge uh, way to make money. So not only are uh, criminals extorting the labor unions for the money that they have from the collection of dues, and it, they're also setting up their traditional rackets of loan sharking so basically it would be like you're down there uh you get your paycheck once a week we, here we'll offer you a loan on monday because you don't get paid till friday and even if you didn't want to necessarily take the loan it was like a bad idea i've read that if you if you weren't taking loans or you weren't placing bets with these guys they would mean trouble for you they wanted you to like but when you got your check on friday to basically just give it right back to them so it really was like a tough deal working down there. You're doing this hard, like, back-breaking work, and then you got these uh, hoodlums walking around and just trying to extort you and take your money. And if you act out of order or look at them the wrong way, and especially if you complain or say something about that, that was completely frowned upon. If you made any type of noise about these people doing anything to you, it was going to mean way more trouble for you. And that's where the guy Tommy Sullivan, that um, was like a main character in the story that I'm talking about. And shout out to uh, Springs Toledo, uh, writer for the City Journal. So I got this story from, it's like an article back in the City Journal back in like 2017. I guess this is like a real name. This guy's name is Spring Toledo. He's from the Boston area. He wrote this really good article about Tommy Sullivan and what happened to him. Tommy Sullivan was a guy who, in his earlier life, never smoked, never drank, never cursed. He was a very religious Catholic guy. He lived with his mother his whole life, was devoted to her. Um, there's rumors, I, I guess, that he was possibly homosexual just because he never had girlfriends or was never married, but I don't know if there was any like legitimacy to that. Um, he had an undefeated boxing career until December 1946 when Al Red Priest, who was out of Cambridge, who was a top 10 middleweight back then, um, knocked him out. And then 10 months later, he lost again. And he realized by 1949 that he didn't want to become a human punching bag and that he was not going to make it as a boxing pro. So he ended up down on the docks in South Boston. He was from East 5th Street in South Boston. I say he lived with his mother his whole life. 
And um, he had a pretty cushy job um, working down there. He wasn't down the hole. He wasn't uh, unloading the freight by hand. He was working like this tractor. So basically now uh, there's like no actual guys doing manual labor down unloading the freight off these big freight terminals. There's guys that run these gigantic cranes and they're actually building like, um, I think it's like a couple million dollars. They're building this huge super crane because during COVID there was these huge backups and they couldn't unload the freight fast enough at the Connolly Terminal in South Boston. So I remember because when I was working at Americold, our containers were getting like delayed day after day after day and they were paying demerage for them at the South Connolly Terminal, South Boston Connolly Terminal because they couldn't unload the freight off these container ships and they were like lined up out in the ocean waiting to come into port. But um, back in the day, Sullivan operated one of the first, like, the, these old-fashioned tractor things that used to, like, hoist um, the freight up. And so he didn't personally go down and handle freight by hand, even though he was, like, a big, physically strong guy who was in great shape because he was a professional boxer back in the day. But he had kind of a cushy job because you back in the day it was, like, and there was all guys working together and it was a lot of, like, testosterone and, like, who was, like, you know, the toughest and blah, blah, blah. So if you were like an ex-boxer or like a real tough guy and had a real tough street rep, you got more respect down the docks and you got to obviously work the better jobs and people weren't going to like argue with you over it because they didn't want the hands apparently. <laughs> so he had a kind of a cushy job down there. But he did not like bullies. He, like I said, he, in his younger life, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't curse, very Catholic, very family-oriented. He was looked up to by a lot of neighborhood kids. He was always real generous with kids in the neighborhood, give them, like, pocket change, buy them candy. His nieces and nephews loved him. Uh, he used to take him to the movies and stuff like that. So he was always looking out for, like, the little guy and, like, the underdog and stuff like that. And he did not like how guys like the McLaughlins were treating people down the docks. These regular working guys who mind their own business and were family men and were just coming and trying to do their job, work, not looking for trouble. They were getting smacked around, uh, you know, belittled, demeaned, like um, just coming to work to do their job. And they got these guys just giving them problems on a, on a day to day basis. So Tommy Sullivan started standing up to these guys. And that was not the best idea. So naturally, with Tommy Sullivan being like this and not liking bullies and wanting to stand up for the weaker guys on the docks that couldn't stand up for themselves, he was going to end up coming with odds with the McLaughlins and the guys that were trying to infiltrate the docks and trying to shake down the union members and the unions at large. So he worked at the Army base in South Boston. Um, he was from East 5th Street in South Boston. That's where his mother lived. It was about a 15-minute walk. He would walk home every night and have dinner at his mom's house. Um, so in 1951, at this army base, longshoremen were getting sick of being pushed around and that the gangsters were infiltrating the unions more and more and controlling the docks. So they formed a line around this giant freighter called the Steel Flyer and they refused to empty the freight off the boat. And so everything came to a still. So when the bosses found out about this, they called... Uh, the goon squads, i.e. the Punchy McLaughlins and those guys, they used to call them knockdown men. And uh, they sent them out and they started going around to all like the big wigs uh, in the labor unions, guys who controlled like the, the minions of the labors. They started pulling people out of their houses, dragging them out and pulling them into cars at gunpoint, beating these guys. They were being found in alleyways behind buildings. Um, in one instance, the goons were out there. They were bundling this outspoken international longshoreman leader, Bill Windy Mahoney. And uh, there was like a group of these guys bundling him in the entranceway, in the hallway of the apartment building he lived in. And one of his neighbors saw what was happening and opened the window and yelled out, Hey, they're jumping Bill Windy. They're jumping Windy over here. So a bunch of dudes from the neighborhood ran over and uh, started rushing the, the group of goons that were jumping this guy. And apparently... Punchy McLaughlin was 
the ch- was in charge of this goon squad, and he had to pull his pistol out and start shooting it in the air so the guys would part way and they could make their exit out of this building because there was a huge mob of guys from South Boston that showed up, and they were trying to box him into this building, and Punchy had to shoot his way out. But um, apparently, word was that the New York ILA boss, this guy Joe Ryan, who was just completely notorious, who had all types of underworld connections, and he was very corrupt and a lot of people blame him for making New York waterfront as corrupt as it was and letting the mob take such control as they did in the 1940s but word was that he was sending goons up from New York City and he was in connection with the goons up here in Boston and word was that Punchy was with New York like a hundred percent that he was working with them and for them so it wasn't really like a question but joe ryan apparently he was working with pun- with goons like punchy but he was also the word in the street was that he was sending goons up from new york because he was trying to quell uh these strikes because it was bad for business um when the boats weren't getting unloaded nobody was getting paid so after all this, the Boston Longshoremen stood united, and 1,500 dock workers staged a walkout, and none of the freight was loaded or unloaded on any ships. And the Longshoremen of Boston were basically taking a stand, and they were saying, we're the ones who run the docks, we're the workers. Like, you mobsters don't run anything. So the stuff between Tommy Sullivan and Punch McLaughlin came to a head shortly after this in 1952 when... Um, at Jimmy O'Keefe's restaurant, I think it was in Dorchester maybe, or was in South, yeah, I don't know, but Sullivan was sitting there and he was heard talking loudly and he said, I can't stand and watching little people get pushed around, so I'm not very popular with some people on the waterfront, and I know it. So he was very aware of the fact that he was not liked, that he was making noise, that he was like standing up for the little guy. So they had this thing on the waterfront, they called it D&D, called Dumb and Deaf, where it was like don't say you don't you don't say anything basically you you see something you hear something you don't say you know like they say hear something say something uh hear something see something say something on the docks it was hear something see something don't say nothing you know uh you were like uh scorned not only were you looked down upon and scorned and kind of like ostracized for talking but you would catch a beating or maybe worse from guys like punching McLaughlin and these goons these knockdown men as they were called so less than an hour after uh, Sullivan was preaching about how he doesn't like little guys getting pushed around, he doesn't like bullies, Punch McLaughlin shows up at O'Keefe's and he walks into the restaurant, sneaks up behind Sullivan and he's got a big metal bolt or screw wrapped in a piece of newspaper and he walks up and he sucks Sullivan from behind and cracks him over the head with this bolt wrapped in newspaper and Sullivan goes down hard like a sack of potatoes, he's gushing blood. So Punchy thinks he's really he's proud of this. He's thinking, oh, I got this, you know, this big tough Tommy of you know, Tommy Sullivan, big tough boxer from Southie. I showed him. So he walks outside and he's got a big smile on his face. And moments later, out on Boylston Street comes charging a mad bull, Tommy Sullivan with blood running down his face. And I guess Punchy McLaughlin looked horrified. He thought he took Sullivan down that they're going to have to call an ambulance for him or whatever. He cracked his wig. Two seconds later, Sullivan comes charging out onto Boyle's Street after Punchy McLaughlin. Blood running out of his face. He must have looked horrifying. So Punchy, I guess Punchy dove off under, like, cl- jumped off the sidewalk and tried to crawl underneath the car. And Sullivan couldn't get him from underneath the car. And he was trying to get him to come out and fight him. And Punchy, who was a pretty tough guy who people were afraid of, he wouldn't come out. So... Sullivan was so full of rage and he was such a strong guy anyways he got some superhuman strength and apparently he picked the car up it was a sedan he picked it up enough to get one of the wheels one of the back rear wheels up onto the curb enough that he could get his arm underneath the car and he grabbed McGough and Punchy's leg and he ripped him out of the car and then in like uh like I said this guy he was just I guess he was like super superhuman strength anyways he was like freakishly strong but he was just so angry and full of rage he had you know uh I can't say it on YouTube what he has but you know it's R word strength <laughs> my friend Colin used to get it in elementary school if you push Colin too far he'd snap and he'd like take out ten people but 
Tom, he saw him and picked him up, I guess. He, ripped, he grabbed by the leg, he ripped him out from underneath the car. He picked him up and he threw him over the hood of the car like a sack of potatoes, walked around the car, picked Punch him. Punch wasn't a small guy. He was like 220 pounds, like six feet tall, 5'11". He, was he wasn't small. Picked him up by his shirt lapels, picked him up in the air, slammed him down on the hood of the car, and then... Oh my God, it's hard to even say. He pulled... Punchy's legs apart, looked him in the eye apparently and says, I'm going to make sure that none of you are ever on this earth ever again. And he gave him an uppercut right to the nuts. Punchy screamed so loud like, a, like, a, like an animal that they could hear him six blocks away screeching as Tommy <laughs> Sullivan, former pro boxer, Gave him a straight uppercut to the ball bag. Ouch. Poor Punchy, man. He did have a son. I don't know if he had the son before or after this, but... So, of course, directly after this, some goon squads from Charlestown started circling around South Boston looking for Tommy Sullivan. Apparently, a car full of guys saw him walking down the street and pulled up on him, but... I don't know how they didn't learn their lesson from the beating of a lifetime that he gave Punchy McLaughlin. They rolled up on him without pieces, and he ended up beating the bag out of three out of the four guys, and the other guy just ran away. So, I mean, <laughs> needless to say, they didn't roll up on him without pieces again. But all this, um, you know, fighting against the mob and... Trying to stand up for the little guys. It started taking its toll on Tommy Sullivan. And the clean living guy who never drank, never smoked, um, you know, went to church every Sunday, was always with his mother, taking care of his mother. He started um, staying out all night drinking, um, getting into fights on a more regular basis, and not for the most noble of reasons. He wasn't standing up for the little guys. Sometimes he was like beating the crap out of guys that were way uh you know less formidable than him guys that he was kind of picking on they shouldn't have been fighting and, and he just kind of started to sink and rumors were that a big reason for this might have been as well is that not only was he standing up f against these mobsters um you know in the public light and fighting them and standing up to punch mclaughlin and, and beating these guys up but he was also starting to work with law enforcement officials. And one of the worst things in 1950s in South Boston that you could be labeled was an informer or to be rumored to be working with the authorities no matter what the cause of. Somebody was messing with your family or doing something to you or somebody did something, no matter how heinous it was, it was like the mindset was you deal with it yourself. You don't work with the authorities. You don't inform. That was something that was brought over from the old world, from Ireland. They hated informers, and South Boston was so insular and so still like the old world, like all the streets and neighborhoods were set up where all the guys, it was like, street was county by county, it was like, okay, you were from Galway, you are from here, you live with all the same people from the same area in Ireland that you came from, and Boston, like, just basically, they policed themselves, if People would, do, if kids were like breaking street lamps or doing vandalism, they would catch a beating, you know? Um, people regularly left the police station in South Boston for being interrogated and ambulances going to the hospital and just leaving bloodied and bruised. It was like a regular occurrence. So the fact that Tommy Sullivan like actually had this physical altercation with Punch McLaughlin obviously put his life in danger just for that simple for that for that instance alone but then the fact that he was most likely working with authorities as well and this was probably one of the main reasons i was pushing him into this downward spiral of alcoholism um that would definitely mark him for death if it were to be even rumored on the waterfront and on the streets of south boston that, that he was possibly working with the authorities and giving information. And apparently, uh, Stevie Wallace, who is Frankie Wallace's brother, Frankie Wallace used to be 
the leader of the Gustin gang, who used to be one of the most powerful gangs in South Boston during Prohibition. Stevie Wallace still was a pretty powerful guy in the streets in South Boston. He ran the Sportlight, I think it was called, on Old Colony Ave. It was a real popular bar, and apparently he, he was asked about Tommy Sullivan. He said that he was an effing rat, so... So apparently in the streets boss the streets of South Boston he didn't have a great rep as far as that goes in the later part of his life anyhow. The International Longshoremen's Association worst fear as a labor union came true in September of 1952 when they were kicked out of the American Federation of Labor. So this all the major labor unions in the country belong to this and they get get protection from uh, politicians, the American government. And just basically gives them legitimacy. And to not be a member, it's kind of you're on. Uh, it's almost like a death sentence. Like you're. It's a matter of time before your your labor union's gonna go under. So this probably brought a lot of suspicion, a lot of accusations. So I'm sure that people started becoming more suspicious of Tommy Sullivan after this happened. That somebody was giving information, working with authorities, uh, telling them about the corruption and underworld connections so um, apparently around Thanksgiving of this year he got Tommy Sullivan that has got the or else warning from some New York big wigs you know some gangsters from the underworld he wasn't dealing with like the punchy McLaughlin's anymore uh, apparently some really important people told him that he better knock it off uh, he better not be talking to authorities he better not be giving any of the guys trouble, um, better not be getting involved, basically just to stay out of their way and not to get involved in anything that had to do with the ILA or the waterfront or any of this stuff. So shortly after in December, Tommy started going to AA meetings. Uh, he got sober. He realized that uh, his drinking was getting out of control and he was basically just on a downward spiral and that his drinking was not helping the situation with him getting in trouble with these mobsters and gangsters and stuff and handing out beatdowns to people. So uh, apparently he was even going as far as Portland, uh, Maine and speaking at AA meetings back then. I don't think there was, in the 1950s, there was <laughs> certainly not as many AA meetings as there are now. So you probably had to travel a little bit more to get to the meetings. But um, yeah, I read that, that he, he he was actually speaking at meetings. He went as far as Portland, Maine to speak at it. So the night before Tommy Sullivan met his demise on December 21st, 1952, he was at a dance at the Roxbury and Hibernian Club. And then he went to a bar um, with some friends that he was at the dance with. He wasn't drinking. He was sober all night. People that were with him said he was sober. Next night, December 22nd, he went to work at the South Boston Army Base, just like normal, working his normal night shift. Came home for dinner around 6 o'clock. Had dinner with his mom. His sister was there with her kids. His niece actually asked him uh, if she wanted to walk with them on his way back to work, if he wanted to walk with her and her friends down to the movie theater in South Boston, the Strand Theater. He said, no, nah, that's okay. He wanted to watch uh, like the evening news or something before he went back to work, but he declined. And So sad because like, after the fact, I guess this poor little girl for years, like decades after this, she like blamed herself and she was like, if I could have only convinced my uncle to walk with me to the movie theater, this might not have happened. And the guy who I shouted out, uh, Springs Toledo, I guess he was talking to her while he was researching this story and he told her it's like it's not your fault and like this poor like girl like her whole life like she really thought that if she could have got her uncle to walk with him to the movie theater that this might not have happened but these guys were after him and they were going to get him regardless if it was that night or the next night like he was he crossed the line he crossed several lines he crossed the line when he did that to punchy mclaughlin like those charlestown guys probably would have got him even just just for that alone, I don't think Punchy McLaughlin would have let that slide or his brothers. Um, they certainly didn't let it slide when Georgie got his epic beatdown. And for working with the authorities and to telling on the gangsters that are trying to take over the International Longshoremen's Association, that certainly will put a green light in Maki for death in the... Uh, there's really no way you're going to work your way out of that unless you just flee and never, ever come back. But 
they were so powerful in the 1950s and 60s, it didn't matter where you kind of went in the country, necessarily the world, they would have found you, um, really. So on December 22nd, around 6.35, gets his mom on the cheek, tells her goodbye, puts his coat on, and he starts to walk back to work for his 15-minute walk back to the army base. This guy does this every single night, you know, that he's at work. Goes home for his dinner break, walks home. It's totally ordinary, nothing out of the ordinary. He's walking home. I mean, he's walking back to work from his house, about 50 yards from his front steps, in front of the Hawk Cemetery. A sedan pulls up, and he hears, "Tommy over here!" And as he turns, a man produces a 38 Special. Releases five shots, hits Tommy, gets out of the vehicle, walks up, puts a couple more in his head to make sure he's gone. Gets back in the car, it roars off towards Ella Street, not to be seen again. People all from all over the neighborhood hear the shots, come running out. Word quickly spreads all around Southie. Tommy Sullivan got shot. <clears throat> Um, a priest shows up on the scene from Heaven's Gate Church, Tommy's um, local parish, is Catholic Church in South Boston. He's been a member of his whole life and I think attended every service every Sunday with his mother. Uh, and gives him last rites on the scene. Word gets to his niece who's at the movie theater, The Strand, in South Boston. Somebody comes running into the movie theater in the middle of the movie and yells, Tommy Sullivan, anybody know Tommy Sullivan? You just got shot. She came running out of the movie theater crying. There's a huge crowd that gathered. Uh, he was pronounced dead on the scene. It was just a real tragic, horrific thing, right? Right, basically, like, 50, like I said, 50 yards from his house. Like, from, you could see the crime scene from the, from the window, you know? And it was right before Christmas. All the neighbors had their Christmas lights up. Um, they had his funeral the day after Christmas. Um few days at you know like what five days after the murder um over a thousand people showed up there was all types of longshoremen there politicians um people from every walks of life you know all all types of people from south boston were there unfortunately his 83 year old heartbroken mother mary sullivan couldn't physically attend the funeral whether it was just from I don't know if it was physical reasons or she was just so, I think she was just so distraught she didn't want to go in public and be seen. But they rerouted, they were bringing um, his casket to a cemetery in Roslindale where he was to be buried. And they rerouted the 100 plus vehicle funeral procession to go by East 5th Street so his mother Mary Sullivan could look out the window and see his, her son one last time as they passed by and uh it was a big event in south boston like i said all types of walks of life people from you know longshoremen with the scally caps and politicians and nice suits uh, attended the funeral it was a hundred plus vehicle procession they rerouted it to specifically go by east fifth street i guess all of the neighbors on east fifth street in south boston took their christmas lights down early in, in, in memory of Tommy Sullivan. But then after the fact, like I said, um, his reputation, his memory was a little bit besmirched. And at this point, probably, this was 70 years ago now, so I don't think anybody would even recognize that name. And South Boston is completely different now, so I'm sure I'm, I'm almost positive nobody would recognize that name. And I would, I would be surprised if there's even some of his relatives even living in the South Boston area. But I might be wrong. There could be. But... Um, in the like decades kind of directly following it he is his kind of legend and reputation and memory wasn't that greatly reflected upon they were kind of more remembered him as having maybe possibly worked with um, the authorities and gave information on the longshoremen's association and the, the, the mobsters that were trying to infiltrate no matter how noble his cause might have been the fact that he just because of the mentality of the old world, 
Irish mentality of South Boston back in the day, and that informer was the worst thing to possibly be. Even the fact that there was rumored that he worked with the authorities, you know, that would that would be enough to just besmirch his memory and his legend. But like I said, in his early life, the guy was looked up upon, looked up to by local kids, by his neighbors, by his community at large. He was a professional boxer, and he was just a really just upstanding guy. Didn't drink, smoke, curse, um, took care of his family, his neighborhood. Um, just kind of a sad story all in all, but a great piece of Boston lore from a completely different time and world when Boston was just, this is pre-1960s Irish gang war, um, and I made that video about what Boston was like um, before the Irish gang war of the 1960s, and this was what Boston was like. It was these tough working class ethnic enclave neighborhoods like South Boston, Charlestown with the Irish, East Boston with the Italians, uh, you know, Dorchester was mixed, Rocks. It was just, this is what Boston was like back then, you know, and the waterfront was like a bustling, just crazy wild place where there was longshoremen, stevedores, Lumpers mixing out, rubbing elbows with gangsters and leg breakers and these knockdown men, and it was just like a wild time where there was you could get loans, place a bet, um, <laughs> uh, and just you know wall wire at work, you know punching the time clock. So if you like this video, hit the like button. Uh, I love doing the videos about old Boston and what times used to be like and. Just because uh, it's such a different place now, and I wish it was more like it used to be. Not so much that people couldn't go to work without getting threats of violence every day against them, but just that there was still more of a blue-collar, working, uh, just culture in the city. So like I said, if you like this video, hit the like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed yet. I don't know why you wouldn't be subscribed yet. Um, comment, make a request, take good care of yourself, make good decisions, make choices. I'll probably only be having a video maybe once, twice a week for a little while now. Um, I had a lot coming out in September, but October is nice. I like the fall. I got a lot of stuff to do with my family, and of course, so I don't stop clamming ever. So make good choices, make good decisions. Take good care of yourselves, your family, your loved ones, other human beings. Have a great day. I'll talk to you guys soon. God bless.